In the first part of this module, we'll review some common coordinate systems used to solve a variety of problems in physics that can simplify uh, calculations. Before starting, I want you to take a moment and think about the various interpretations of integrals that you learned about and try to identify what you think the most useful interpretation is for physics problems. I encourage you to pause the video here and take some time to think about this. So if you recall from calculus, if you have a function of x, that looks, let's say something like that. And you are interested in finding the area under this curve. You would, one way of doing it was to break up the space under this curve into rectangles such as these. So the middle point of each rectangle will identify as xi star and the width of any one rectangle will write as delta xi. So this is f of x. When you found was the area which we wrote down as the integral from a to b of f of x dx was equivalent to an infinite sum of the area of each one of these rectangles. So each one of these rectangles has a height f of xi star and a width of delta xi. And you would sum up the areas of these rectangles in the limit that you have infinitely many of them. So the way that you should probably most often think about an integral is as a sum of very small things. And we'll come back to this interpretation throughout the course. For the purposes of coordinate systems, you're all familiar with the Cartesian coordinate system, which in 2D is typically identified as having an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. And in this coordinate system, you can break up space in 2D into little rectangles such as these with width delta X and height delta Y, giving each one of these rectangles an area of delta X times delta Y. In three dimensions, you have X, Y, and Z Cartesian coordinate system. And three-dimensional space in Cartesian coordinates can be broken up into little cubes, where I've just drawn a big one uh, so that I can annotate it. But think of these as infinitesimally small cubes. And this has site length delta y over here, delta x over here, and delta z over here. So that the volume of each one of these uh, cubes or um, 
parallel pipettes to be exact was delta x, delta y, delta z. All right. So this was a Cartesian coordinate system. And in the in the limit where delta x and delta y are very small, then we change this delta a into an infinitesimal dA. And similarly, with the dimensions of this three-dimensional parallel pipette are very small. Then we again replace this delta V by an infinitesimal. So in physics, we can often simplify the calculations involved in a problem by recasting it in a different coordinate system. All right, and for the purposes of this module, we're going to focus on three commonly used coordinate systems that you would have seen in electromagnetism. These are polar, cylindrical, and spherical coordinate systems. And in this course, we're just going to give a brief review of these because we'll come back to their use throughout the course. So the polar coordinate system is a two dimensional coordinate system and it has variables R and theta. And as the name implies, this is typically used when your problem involves uh, some kind of circular symmetry or working on uh, something that's circular. And the way you transform from a Cartesian coordinate system to a polar coordinate system is by the following equations. So if you have your polar coordinates and you want to change back to Cartesian, you would use these. And if you have your Cartesian coordinates and you want to change to polar, these are the transformations you need to do. Okay, so the way to think about this is if you draw this out in an X and Y coordinate system and you're trying to get, you have some coordinates X and Y. The R variable gives you the distance from the origin and the theta variable gives you the inclination of that point relative to the X axis. We can also um, sort of derive what the area element uh, would look like. So the equivalent of this uh, dA is equal to dx dy. We want to know what this is once we've transformed it into polar coordinates. So we're going to break up space into uh, small area elements. And this picture will become more clear in a moment. 
So if I identify this angle over here as d theta, this angle over here as theta, this part of the radius as dr, then the area of this element would be given by approximately the length of this side, which by definition is r d theta, because that's the arc length subtended by this angle, and this, the length of this side. So we're approximating this roughly as a rectangle. All right, and this is typically written as r dr d theta. So whenever you have an area element in polar coordinates, this is what it should be replaced by in contrast to having an error element in Cartesian coordinates where you write it in terms of dx and dy. In the next video, we'll go through an example of how using polar coordinates can simplify the evaluation of an integral.